our spire. Well, we started off this year with the theme, Occupy. And it was based, uh, our senior pastor based the theme for this year on the book of Luke chapter 19. And that's a story that, in which the master, a certain man, a rich man, uh, gave each of his ten servants ten minas. And he said to them, ten minas, I, I think he said to us, is the equivalent of about three months' salary. And so this man, this rich man, was going away, and he entrusted his servants with um, these ten minas. And he said to them, operate with this until I return, or invest this for me while I'm gone. And I remember as he started, uh, started us off this year, he said that in, in as much as, you know, the circumstances around us may, uh, may make for fear and uh, kind of the attitude where people would want to shrink back, for us as the people of God, he said, this is the year to occupy. It is the year to step out, to move forward, to make the most of every opportunity that God was going to bring our way. And this is month 10. And I just want to continue to challenge you in that same theme. That as a person who is uh, following God, who is uh, in relationship with God, God's intention for you is to make the most of every opportunity that he gives you. And he said to us from the King James, the King James puts it a little differently, uh, kind of sharply and, and more refined. It says, occupy till I return. And that's where we got this year's theme from. And I've said that, uh, I'll keep saying that as I go through this uh, series, God's intention is for us to take responsibility, to invest, to grow, to multiply, and take ownership over every area. Now, the title of my series as I begin it is, This Is It. Wait, wait, this is it. <laughs> And it's, it's actually named after the this is it that you know. At the age of 50, after a decade's absence from, from stage, Michael Jackson was quietly performing and crafting an entirely new concert experience. His only audience, I got to learn about this, was a small group of technicians and dancers who watched Michael create a show that was going to be his return to the stage. And of course, as we know, it turned out differently. But I wanted to, you know, pitch this title to you in the hopes that you would connect with it. Because I feel that in a sense, Christ is crafting his own concert experience. Christ is con uh, crafting a concert experience for us, for the church, for each one of us that he has called into relationship with him. And he has called us to share the stage with him and to be an extension of him. This life that you're living, this is it. Look at your neighbor and see if they are prepared to step onto the stage of life and perform a serious performance. <laughs> As I begin, let me ask you a question. What sorts of things were you once good at, but that you no longer do? Let me say that again. Maybe I'm running the questions at you so fast. Huh? There were some things you used to do, and you were good, you know, either very good or reasonably good at them. And maybe you, you don't do them anymore. Are there any such things in your life? By the way, I used to play hockey, as you're seeing me here. <laughs> With this uh, powerful figure of mine, I used to play hockey, and I scored one or two goals in my time. <laughs> okay, talk to your neighbor for me. Tell them. Just tell them. You just don't know, but I used to. I used to be a licensed gun holder. With the goings on in this city, <laughs> turn to your neighbor for me. Just touch your jacket meaningfully.
Have you discovered anything surprising about your neighbor? Some exciting things that they used to do and hopefully still do or they no longer do. Even me with my hockey career, the operative word is used to. <laughs> you know, I've discovered about five-year-olds. My son is just shy of five years old. And I've discovered that five-year-olds live to run all day. They run all day. They run the whole day. They stop a little bit to eat so that they can run some more. And then they are stopped by sleep, dead in their tracks. They just stop and you carry them to bed. And they wake up the next day and run again the next day. Now, most of us here used to be five years old. And, I've, you know, we all have muscles. But when we don't exercise those muscles, what happens? They show up in strange places. Tell your neighbor, I know you are five years old once upon a time. You look like you used to run the whole day just to make things difficult for your mom. <laughs> you know, we all have muscles, but the point I'm trying to make is that if we don't use them, something happens to, to them. We all have certain abilities, but when we disuse them, there's an impact. Many of us here studied a foreign language. Tell your neighbor, you just don't know. There was Spanish taught in my school. You just don't know. They taught me Italian as you're seeing me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I actually, I've, I actually studied, can I say this, on top of the many lofty titles I've been given this morning, I've studied eight years of German. It's a very serious matter. Eight years of German. <laughs> yes, Pastor Carol has slipped in a little tidbit of information there. Eight years, uh, four years in high school, four years um, at university level at the University of Nairobi but I don't use that German anymore. I've noticed that when Pastor Kema sends people on assignment to Berlin, they don't choose me. <laughs> eh? They don't tell me, sister, you are a powerful speaker. Can we send you? <laughs> because I don't use it anymore, you know, and so it's sort of uh, fallen by the wayside. I can say one or two words, but that's about it. You know, my goal this month, as I start off this series, is this. I'll tell you right at the outset. My goal is to involve as many of you as possible, as young as you may be, as soon as possible, within your landing in this Mavuno church in a serving opportunity. I desire this month to ask you, to uh, persuade you, and to involve you uh, in engaging in service, asking you not to wait until, until you feel you're ready, because if we, feel, if we wait until we feel we are ready, we will really wait a long time. The sooner you can get into a serving opportunity, all of these experiences that God has poured into your life, the gifts and capabilities, the competencies that God has endowed you with, the better, even if you're not fully trained yet. And the reason is this. My conviction is that as God's people, as we serve, we begin to occupy spiritually. It is as you deploy the gifts of God in you that you begin to grow, multiply your spiritual potential. It is as you do that that you maximize uh, the possibilities of God in your life. Now, some of you here may be, you know, may, you have, may have been in a relationship with Christ for a while. Some of you are just starting out. Some of you maybe are not even there yet in your, by your own description. But I want to suggest to you that you can learn something as you serve. That the, the service opportunity is just the perfect place for you to begin to grow and to multiply. Now, God has given each one of us something. But my my own conviction is that many of us live be below our potential. There are so many things that we could do and contribute, but many of us live below our potential because we don't always understand that the smallest action can have the greatest effect. Sometimes we wonder, whatever I have, can it really make a difference? Can it really contribute something of value? And we fail to understand that the smallest actions can have the very greatest effects. Now, we saw that in our city very graphically in the Westgate situation, didn't we? Didn't we see people serving in all sorts of ways, big and small? And I know we've had many, many conversations about this, but allow me as I start this just to sort of uh, remind us and prompt us. We saw women uh, coming out to serve tea and food to all of the people who are at the front lines and at the scene of what happened. And would you believe that even somebody's gift of hospitality could have made a difference in what really was a national crisis? Look at your neighbor. They might be the kind of person who can flip chapatis all night. I mean, you know, called upon. <laughs> the medics is another category. These are people who we had seen out on the street, 
dissatisfied, disgruntled because their pay and working conditions were just inadequate and, you know, unsatisfactory. But these are the same people who put their lives on hold, worked around the clocks, uh, you know, to save the lives of others. The journalists, one may say that that is, you know, what they are paid to do, but uh, I think it was uh, Pasanelli who last week said, you can only be paid so much to do your job. These people actually expose themselves in a very hostile situation to update the public. And then get a load of this. I've never seen this in all my born days here in Kenya. Fuel prices have come down in our lifetime, isn't it? In living memory, fuel prices. Matatu prices have never come down. I'm, I kid you not, aren't they the brunt of most of our bile? Okay, not your bile. You are Mavunites. This is the home of the fearless. <laughs> we always say things about mat Matatu operators, but they reduced their fare so that Kenyans could go and donate blood. And we saw people in all sorts of spaces. Oh yeah, give it up for them. Come on, Mavuno. <laughs> we saw people in all sorts of places just acting in a manner that, to suggest that they understood the smallest action can have the greatest effect. And I learned something from West, Westgate, actually. Uh, in, I, I spent a lot of time around Christians and around the church. But I learned one thing from that situation. That whether people are Christians or not, we are created to occupy. We are created to occupy. Whether people are Christians or not. In the words of Pastor um, Nelly, I could be your Abdul Hajj baby. <laughs> There's an Abdul Hajj in, in people, surprisingly. Okay, you're laughing at my singing abilities. Clearly, I was not created to occupy musically. But, <laughs> but there is a hero. There is, you know, something that God has put in each one of us. You know, many times when I listen to a eulogy, I feel when I go to somebody's service, you know, a, a friend or a loved one, that has passed on, I feel like I know very, very little about the person being described. Like I knew little about the, per uh, about the person. You know, you, you sit there and you, you hear stuff because it's being shared by the entire community. You hear stuff that you didn't actually know. Have you had that experience? I had a friend pass on maybe two and a half or so months ago. We attended her funeral and I got to know so much about Grace that I, didn't, I hadn't actually known. What a remarkable life that she had lived. This woman was the manager of a, a hospitality establishment, but I discovered during her, her service that she was also a farmer, passionate farmer, and she was a board member of many ministries. She had hung out with many prominent personalities. She was a single woman, actually, uh, you know, uh, beyond her 40s, but that she had been an auntie to many, many children of the families that she was associated with. I learned that Grace loved to bake, and that every Christmas, instead of sitting in her house and saying, Woye, this woman would actually bake every Christmas about 25 cakes and go about distributing them. We actually were the recipient of one of these cakes last December. She also loved plants, and many of the plants that we have in our home um, you know, were given by grace, several of these plants. But I only knew her in one role. Tell your neighbor for me, there's so much in each of us. There's so much in each of us. But it all comes down to whether or not we understand that God's intention is for us to make the most of what he has put in us. To take responsibility and to occupy here on earth. Now for us to grow and to multiply and to occupy, there are certain attitudes and mindsets that we need to embrace. And I want to share those with you this month. Turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 8. Uh, we want to read just three verses, 16 through 18. And I want uh, to share one attitude, one mindset that can help us to occupy and to grow. Now, because these are just three verses, I want us to read them together. Is that okay? Is it up there on the screen? Okay. Let's read that together. One, two, three. No one lights a lamp and hides it in a clay jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed 
and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they have, will be taken from them. Thank you very much. What can we learn about growing and multiplying spiritually, about maximizing the potential that we have in us? You know, the passage preceding this one immediately, uh, the beginning of Luke chapter 8, talks about the parable of the sower, which may be familiar to many of us. And it's uh, this sower who goes out and he, he scatters seed, and the seed lands on different kinds of soil, and the seed sprouts, uh, and it uh, brings fruit, and it bears fruit uh, of different uh, quantities. And so I just want to piggyback on that as I begin to open up this. My understanding is that when God sows his word into our lives, when we encounter him, when he calls us into relationship with him, ultimately his intention on the basis of this verse is to light a lamp in our lives. He intends to light up a lamp in our lives and then not only to light up the lamp, but to put it on a stand, to put you on a stand so that those who come in or who come around you, who come within proximity of your life, will see the light of God in you. There is no such thing as obscurity, is what I understand from this passage in God's uh, kingdom and in God's economy. Now, what does it mean to set something on a stand? You know, I've come here and I have set my notes on a... I've set my notes on a... We do these things, we don't even think about them. But to put something on a stand is to put it in a specified position. God wants to put each one of us in a specified position. Just like we put a book, these days we put an iPad on a table. He wants to put you in a specified state, a stable position. For instance, the way we set a fence post into a bed of concrete. God wants to do that in our lives. He wants to restore you. To set also means to restore to a proper and normal state. Like, for instance, if something was dislocated or broken, he wants to set our lives on a stand, to restore us to a proper state, to adjust for proper functioning is the other meaning of the word set. He wants to put us to a specific point of calibration, the way we set an alarm clock. God wants to do that. He wants to light his lamp or his, uh, the light of his word in your life and then to raise you up or calibrate you to a certain point so that people can see what his work is in your life. Another meaning of the word set is to arrange properly for use. To set like we do uh, a dinner table, to set a place for a dinner guest. God wants to set you and arrange you properly so that he can use you. That's his intention for all of our lives. You know, the real tragedy in our lives though, in my estimation, is that many of us who have come into a relationship with Jesus, people don't even see any difference in us. They cannot see our lives emitting light. We live our lives as if we had hidden the light under a clay jar or under a bed. At your office, do people know that there's light in you? Uh, okay, ask your neighbor for me. Maybe if I've been asked from the pulpit is a bit intimidating. Just ask them for me. Tell them, relax. Welcome to the home of the fearless. Start from far. <laughs> ask them, how are you finding the weather these days? It's been so unpredictable. And then ask them, by the way, at your office, do people know there's light in you? In your family? You know, I think this passage actually tells us how we can get to the place where our lives begin to emit that light. How our lives can begin to emit that light. And, and I'm saying that when we begin to grow, our lives will emit that light. You know, verse 18 gives a very um, interesting answer. It's one of those verses that is kind of cryptic and a little difficult to understand, at least for me. Let me read it again, Luke um, 8, verse 18. It says, therefore, consider, consider carefully, sorry, how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they have will be taken from them. Is that one of those cryptic Bible verses? Somebody says, I know. Well, I was able to to, you know, sort of stumble on, on um, a, um, a reading that opened up this verse for me a little bit. It says, whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they have, will be taken from them. And it means this. 
Whatever we allow to lie unused as something of little value, even what we think we have will be taken away from us. Whatever we allow to lie unused, you know, we have it, but we allow it to lie unused as something of little value, even what we think we have will be taken away from us. But whatever we keep as a thing which we value, we will be given more of and have an abundance. Look at your neighbor's hair and see if they are taking care of it as something of great value. <laughs> you guys are going all spiritual on me here. You see how the, the way my hair is looking. Am I taking care of it? I've even added more and I have an abundance. <laughs> Life is harsh, you guys. When I got home from the salon, my husband took one look at me and he just did his mouth like this. <laughs> so I decided to occupy the month and walk boldly regardless. Anyway. <laughs> you know, what do you do? <laughs> Whatever we allow to lie and use as something of little value, even what we think we have will be taken away from. But what we keep as a thing of value. I'm talking about hair because women keep their hair as a thing of value. See, Nikweli, you nurture it. What else do you do? What do you do? You treat it, eh? Uh -huh. You moisturize it. You texturize it, eh? Uh -huh. You extend it, eh? Uh -huh. What else do you do? You weave it, eh? Uh -huh. uh -huh. And you will be given more and you will have an uh, <laughs> oh my goodness, you people are losing me from this text completely. I'm sure that is not what the writer meant when he said that. But I'm just saying there are things in our lives that we treat well, isn't it? And we harness it and we nurture it. And I'm saying that there's a principle here. And this is my one point in this message, that we strengthen what we exercise. But we weaken and eventually lose what we disuse. We strengthen what we but we weaken and lose what we, we disuse. Now, we see this principle at work in, you know, life all around us. Where in the world do we see people perfecting what, we re what, what they repeat? Where do we see people perfecting things by repetition? Sports, for sure. Music. Let me give you a couple of examples. You remember this guy, Daniel, Daniel Owira Otonglo? <laughs> this guy shot to fame recently, not too long ago, with his performance at the Mombasa State House, with his words, just his words. This is a high school kid, if I'm not mistaken, from South B, here, here. A true African will point to South B with your lips because you're in the general neighborhood. South B? <laughs> Where? Talk to me, Mavuno. So be just here. <laughs> Imagine that you will be here in South Sea for several years. We have never heard that you've been given a tour, personal tour at the State House. So be here, here. <laughs> tell, the, tell your neighbor, the Almighty should help you. Yeah, he should help you because you have not catapulted from here to the State House. <laughs> I mean, this boy just went before the president and I think he must have been practicing his art and his theatrics and his gift of the gab. And he just went there. He was not nervous in front of the head of state and he said, to wit me, Mr. President, to wit. And that's how he landed there. <laughs> By perfecting. And to my astonishment, this young man is now doing ads on national television and getting paid for it. My goodness, we strengthen what we exercise. But we weaken and lose what we disuse. Here's another example of a place where we see people perfecting what they repeat. Tasker Project fame. You know, East Africa reality singing competition. And uh, people who compete there hope to win cash and a one-year record deal. You know, what is so scary for me is the lengths to which people will go. They will subject themselves to terrible exposure in the hopes. Ah! You will see people shaking, singing, and closing their eyes. <laughs> but the thing is, they are exercising and strengthening what they exercise. You who is sitting here, has anybody offered you a deal? That you are sitting here. <laughs> Let 
going to give you a couple of other, you know, it's terrible the things that people will put themselves through. But they have understood the principle. We strengthen what we exercise. Sinikweli. And we eventually lose what we disuse. Although some of them have already lost it and they don't know. <laughs> it's okay. They will be told. <laughs> Here's another example. Paul Tergat. And many, many of our sports icons here in this country. These people exercise daily, consistently. Our very own Aaron Crucial Keys Rimbui. I understand that he exercises, you know, on the scales for two hours every day. Whether there is Project Fame or not. For two hours every day. You, where are you? Maybe you just bellow out one number in the shower and you trust God for stardom. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm among those people also who belt out one number in the shower. I understand that Beyonce is borderline ruthless when it comes to her rehearsals. So you exercise, you strengthen what you exercise and you lose what you disuse. You know, I've already made reference to Michael Jackson's last and greatest production, This Is It. I understand that... Um, the producers had already said that whoever would share the stage with Michael would have to have the spirit of the man and be like the man. And to know what this man was like, um, I found out that at some point, the producers wanted to call off the entire production because they felt that Michael himself did not have the physical strength uh, to just sustain the grueling strain of the rehearsals. They were just not sure he could make it. But this man was himself relentless. He literally pushed himself to the limit. And my question for you is this, Mavuno. If this is how hard people in the world practice in order to occupy their spaces, in order to grow and multiply, what about us? I said to you already that the, you know, in the earlier chapter of Luke chapter 8, it talks about the parable of the sower. And God's plan is to sow his life, his word into our lives. And the passage tells us that there, there are different kinds of soil. But bottom line, that word that is sown in our lives bears fruit. It germinates and bears fruit. And then in Luke chapter 8 verse 16, we've talked about how God's plan, just like human beings, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a bed. They put it on a stand so that everybody who comes around can see it. And if this is how hard people in the world practice, exercise to grow and multiply, how much more us? How much more us? We must constantly exercise God's gift to us, our competencies, our capabilities, so that we would grow spiritually. As I've said, we strengthen what we exercise, but we lose what we disuse. Now, as I said, my goal this month, I want to challenge you, Mavuno, that you would involve more fully in serving in this place. I want to involve as many people as possible. Perhaps you've never had it said, uh, since you came here, that we're looking to involve as many people as possible in serving. And I want to share with you this month the opportunities that are available. We want you to serve as young as you are. As soon as you come, you know, within, within this uh, community, you're welcome to begin to express your gifts here. You know, if you wait to serve until you're ready, you will wait a long time. I remember the first time somebody asked me, not even just to do public speaking, to pray. I prayed about it and said no. And it took me a while. You know, the sooner you get into a serving opportunity, the better. Even if you're not fully trained, because so many things begin to happen. You begin to sense what you like, what you don't like, what you're gifted at, what you're not gifted at. You begin to discover the appropriate place for you to serve. I remember when I was on the internship program at Nairobi Chapel many, many years ago. The very first deployment that I was given was, was youth ministry. You know, after the one year of youth ministry, I knew God had not called me to youth ministry. It was clear to me, it was clear to the, to the youth. They have never asked me since that day. And I've never offered myself. <laughs> Tell your neighbor for me, you will not discover as you are sitting. <laughs> you just throw yourself into it and then you will know. I'm not called to cook chapatis all night. I'm not called to make tea. I'm not called to do all these things. This is what I'm called to do. <laughs> You know, the point I'm trying to make is this. When we serve, this is for us a significant faith builder. There's a way you prepare yourself when you're going to serve that just puts you in the place where your relationship with God begins to grow and you begin to take responsibility. You begin to invest in your relationship with God and begin in many, many senses to occupy. Serving and uh, involvement is a significant faith builder. Now, what is it that keeps many of us from serving, engaging in serving? 
I talked to a few friends of mine and we discussed this. And some of you told me that we want to serve. But if I become, you know, prominent and I'm, you know, sort of visible in the church, what will people think when they find me in a different space? What will people find me when they see me in a totally different space and then they see me in a prominent position? So we feel like there's this conflict of spaces. And I want to say to you, we want you to serve as you are. We really want you to begin to serve as you are. Another uh, person told me that we doubt our faith. Many of us feel insignificant. We're not sure we actually have something of value to offer. But my challenge, uh, you know, to you is this. For me, I find, yeah, I'm praising God that he uses uh, our Pastor M and Pastor Sai. But some of us, when God begins to show off through us, people will say, Kweli ni mungu. I should, have, I should have concluded that, given you the Kenyan opportunity to conclude. Kweli ni mu? You know, everybody is the right candidate. No one of us is the perfect fit, but every one of us is the right candidate. And as we begin to make time for God, he will fit into our lives and he will, you know, do all the work that it takes to close the gaps. Here's another reason many of us don't serve. Somebody said to me, many of us feel stretched from all different angles. I have a wife, I have a kid, uh, milk prices have gone up. He actually said that to me. <laughs> this, <laughs> they have, they've gone down. I'll tell him when I see him. There's so much demand from so many different directions. How do I even add to my existing roles and responsibilities? But I want to say to you, Mavuno, today, that for you to grow, to begin to grow and to to let this light that God has put in you begin to shine. For you to occupy the position God intends for you. To be all that he intends for you. God's call is not that you would just, that, just that you would come to Mavuno, just that you would come into a relationship with him, but that you would begin to serve and to occupy and that you would strengthen what you exercise in order that you might not lose what you have by disusing it. Now I want to bring this service to a close and I want to pray for us. This month, we want to present to you the different platforms that are available for you to express your gifts. Actually, if you would look to, I think this is your left. Is this your left? My right, your left. We have a lot of uh, displays that we have put out there. We want you to connect with the opportunities that we have for you here to serve. Religion has taught us to be humble, you know, and to go about unnoticed. I think in some of the spaces where we've been, we hear that for you to be, you know, somebody really pious, you should just go around creeping and enter into spaces and be unnoticed. But I find that this scripture we've reflected on this morning briefly is a direct contradiction to that. God says, I do not light a lamp to put it under a bed or a clay jar. Instead, I want to set you up on a stand so that everybody who comes in can see. That's God's agenda for each one of us. And the very, very first step is for you to decide. You know, I, I want to say the final decision ultimately rests with each one of us. It's not so much about uh, somebody cajoling you or persuading you. It's you committing. But thank you because you have set, you know, you've lit your lamp in my life. I'm going to let you position me in such a way that people will see your light. I want to ask that we would bow for prayer and then I will lead us in prayer. You are holy. Are you? 
Almighty, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, Amen. You know, I want to pray for us uh, a little differently today. I want to pray for some people who are so discouraged that you're even wondering, now how is this message going to help me? Where I am, I'm not feeling this vibe. That's who I want to pray for. That's who I want to pray for. You're like, I, where I am, my circumstances, I can't even put one foot in front of the other. Now God is asking me to serve. I have already been occupied by discouragement. That's who I want to pray for this morning. I got a word for you from Isaiah 61. The Lord gave me a clear word that the Spirit of God is present here today to assure you that you who is feeling so discouraged, you're the one who God wants to shine His light in your life. This was me. I don't know that whether I've shared this at Mabuno before, but my call to ministry was really confirmed because of the set of circumstances I found myself in. I was very discouraged as a young person about the home situation. Things were not working out for my parents. And I promised God, out of that discouragement, that if he would intervene for us, that I would rise up in my generation and be an encouragement. And so you who is discouraged, the word of God to you is Isaiah 61, verse 3, and it says that he wants to appoint for the ones who mourn to, in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, so that he would be glorified. If this is you, would you raise your hand and I will pray for you. And then I will pray for those, all those others who have never taken the opportunity to serve, but you would like to do that. If there's any such, would you raise your hand? You're like this message, I, I'm not occupying, I've been occupied, I don't even know where to start applying this message. Raise your hand. Please raise, maybe, let me ask you to stand to your feet and I will pray over you. Stand to your feet and I will pray over you just that the Lord would encourage you. The word I'm trying to share in your life is that you who is so overwhelmed, it is exactly you that God wants to turn things around. The situation you're experiencing right now is not the end goal. God's end goal is to turn around your discouragement and make you an encourager in this generation. I'm telling you, the Lord is determined to do battle on your behalf, to help you to be victorious in the circumstances. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we pray for these who are standing, who cannot even come connect with the message of occupying because things are difficult for them. And I want to speak a word of encouragement as I thank you for your calling on my life in a season of discouragement. Thank you that for each one of these, you want to raise them up, to set them in position as a channel and a vessel of encouragement and of hope and the power of God in their lives. And so I want to speak encouragement in their circumstances and ask, Father, that as they take a step of faith in whatever shape or form, that you will begin to turn things around for them. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. God's people said, come on, give God a round of applause. Baba Hakuna Sing it church Baba Hakuna Mwingine kama wewe Mwingine kama wewe Baba Hakuna Baba Hakuna Baba Hakuna Others who feel convinced that you have never taken up opportunity to serve in this church but you want to do that now. As our heads are bowed, would you please raise your hand? God is calling you to occupy. Would you stand and we'll pray with you. No one lights a lamp and sets it under a clay jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, they set it on a stand so that all who come in can see. Please rise to your feet and we'll pray together. Father, thank you for those of us who have encountered your word. And your intention for us is that the light in our lives would give light to as many as come into proximity. I just sense that there are many more who ought to stand for some reason. 
you haven't stood yet, would you stand? Stand. This is your moment. This is your time. Baba Hakuna. When ye they come away with Baba Hakuna. Baba Hakuna. Baba Hakuna. I lift up these men and women whose desire is to maximize their potential in God. That light would emit from them to the glory of your name. And they want you to set them up on a stand. They want to be a part of the life of this church and to be involved in some serving opportunity for them, Lord. I pray that you would pour out your spirit. I pray, Father, that you will clarify for them exactly where it is that you would want them to stand and to step. And that as they do that, they would experience real and significant growth in their relationship with God. Would you do this? I speak your blessing over them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, God's people said, Amen. Amen. God's plan is to put you in a specified position. In a specified state. God wants to restore you, each one of you, to a proper state, proper functioning. He wants to arrange us properly for use. <laughs> Can I say this, church? For many of us, the serving opportunities that we will begin to engage in in this church will be the opportunity that opens doors for you to your platform. Am I making sense? You know, as I've begun to serve many, many years ago here at Mavuno, God has used this space and this opportunity to open many doors in my own life. I'm telling you that this is the home of the fearless influencers. Tell your neighbor for me, God wants to set you up. You just don't know. Preach for me, Mavuno. You just don't know. God wants to set you up. And for many of us, the serving opportunities that we begin to take hold of and exercise in this place will be the way that God opens the door to the next place for you. Let me ask that you would stand and we'll sing this song one more time as we close. I want to invite you to go to my left. We have many stands and we want to share with you the opportunities. Please don't be in a rush. I also want to ask that the pledge cards that you have filled today, you'd give them to the ushers or drop them at the info desk. Let's sing that one more time and I will speak a blessing. Let's lift up our hands and thank the Lord. Lift up your hands and praise the Lord. Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore God's people said Amen God bless you